for today's presentation, um, I'll quickly run you through the agenda for today. So first of all, we're going to start off by talking a little bit about content planning. Uh, so content planning, um, we're going to talk about how to figure out what to create with your content, when to deliver it. Um, and then we're going to follow that up with a bit of a discussion around how you optimize that content. Um, once we've covered those two topics off, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Ollie, who's now jumped the call and he's going to be taking you through how we actually do that within HubSpot uh, and how we use the new SEO tools. So like I said before, any questions come up, I can see them as they come through. So I'm flicking through as they, as they arise. So let's jump into the first pillar of your content strategy and that's the content creation and planning. But before we all start planning our latest and greatest blog post or video, I want you to stop and ask yourself, who are you creating that content for? Who exactly are you creating your content for? And for this, I don't mean millennials or women or men. That's far too broad an example. So what we really want to look at is our buyer personas. Um, and for those of you who've been using HubSpot for a while, you've probably seen buyer personas and the tools, and you're probably well across what they are. But what we're looking for is more around a persona that's a bit more detailed. So in this example here, we've got CEO Tom, we've got human resources Hannah, um, and we've got finance Frank. And because there's a bit of alliteration there, they sound like a bit of fun. Um, but they're there as fictional, semi-fictional representations of your ideal customer. Um, it takes them from a statistic to a living, growing human that you're actually creating your content for. So let's have a look at one of HubSpot's personas, which again, we all love a good bit of alliteration. So here we go. We've got agency Adeline. So, um, this is what a detailed um, persona should look like in practice. So this is a, a real example of one of HubSpot's personas. And you can see there that they have a combination of demographic and psychographic information about their persona. So we're looking at demographics. So Agency Adeline works for an agency with 50 to 20 employees, uh, with five to 20 employees. Um, she's working in an account manager role. She's got an undergrad degree. She's around 30 and career orientated. Um, but then we also go into her goals and her challenges. So by understanding your persona's goals and challenges, you're able to create content that really speaks to their aspirations and pain points. So to help attract people like Agency Adeline to the HubSpot website, um, they need to start creating content that meets her um, helps her meet her goals or um, address her challenges, like how to prove marketing ROI to your clients to increase retention. But your buyer persona really informs your strategy. And once you nail down your buyer personas, you'll have a better understanding of what content to create for them, when to give it to them, um, and where to do so. So if you haven't created a persona before, or you're not sure where to start, of course, HubSpot have got a free tool for that. So if you go to makemypersona.com, they'll go through and ask you some questions to help you build out those personas. Um, it makes the process nice and easy um, for your, um, by taking you through your specific questions about those personas. So, that gets you started with your personas and really how many of those you need depends on your organization and how many personas you actually need. You can have as many or as few as you want. So let's move on to how we decide what content to create. Knowing your persona doesn't solve everything. You can have the best persona in the world and still scratch your head over what to create from time to time. 
So now we know who we're writing for. Now we need to decide what we're creating for those people. So we break this down by looking at the buyer's journey. So what does your persona need help with at each stage of their buyer's journey? So at the awareness stage, they're experiencing and expressing symptoms of a problem or opportunity. So they know that they've got a bit of a problem. They know that maybe they want to solve it. Um, so at this point, they're doing educational research to more clearly understand, frame, and give a name to their problem. Then they move forward to the consideration stage. So they've clearly defined their problem and given a name to their, their problem. They're committed to researching and understanding all of the available approaches or methods to solving their defined problem. So at this stage, they are um, researching different solutions, different providers, different software to try and really get a grip of how they're going to solve this problem. And then they're going to move on to their decision stage. So they've decided on their solution. Um, so this is where they're going to decide on exactly what provider they're going to use or, or how they're going to solve the problem. So they're going to be compiling a uh, list of available vendors, products. They're um, whittling down their long list of providers to a short list to make a final purchase decision. So if we think about their buyer's journey in those three stages, then we can look at mapping the goal of your content onto your buyer's journey. So the way HubSpot talk about this is um, their awareness stage, they talk about their goals being traffic and subscribers. When they reach the consideration stage, their goal is to capture leads so that they can start to help nurture through to the decision stage or marketing qualified leads, people who are qualifying themselves. Then they move on to the decision stage where their goals are totally about customers and revenue. So this helps us just really think about the goal of the piece of content. So are you trying to get more people to discover your brand who might not know they need you yet? If so, you're targeting people in the awareness stage over here. So often views or traffic, subscribers is the metric there. If you're trying to help people understand the solution to a problem that they already know they have, well, those people are going to be searching for different things. They're going to be looking for different information. So you want to target people in the consideration stage and leads is the metric there. Uh, and if you're trying to get people to see that, um, to understand the reason that your company is the best solution, well, that's where you're targeting people in the decision stage, and that's all about the customers. So the key here is to start thinking in terms of topics that you want to own, not just keywords. And that allows you to own a sphere of influence on the internet. And I don't know about you, but when I first heard about this concept, being an SEO guy most of my life, I kind of dismissed it a bit. But the reality is now that Google is so smart, Google's algorithm is so smart, they can look beyond just the keywords and start to look at the broader topics themselves. And that's where Ollie's going to come in and talk a bit about how we structure those out. But we want to look at the, the topic we want to own and just move on a little bit from the keywords because they're just not as important as owning the topics. So we're talking about tools like Answer the Public where you can type in a topic that you want to own. So of course, HubSpot want to own inbound marketing. It's what they do, it's what their software does. And then it spits out all the different questions people are searching for online related to that topic. So you can see exactly what people are searching for. And each one of these could quite easily be a um, piece of content on its own. People are looking for inbound marketing software. They're looking for the what, the when, the why, the how. So this is giving you a really good way of knowing the topic and knowing how we can break that topic down into multiple pieces of smaller content. The good old Google alert is another very uh, overlooked 
free tool that you can get from Google. Um, so you can spy on other people and see what they're already doing in your industry. So with Google Alerts, you can set up alerts for your industry, for your brand name, for your terms, and get emailed when new articles are written about that term. So these handy little notifications in your inbox may spark ideas for future content that you can create. BuzzSumo, again, uh, this, they're using the, the pro plan here. Um, but BuzzSumo is really designed to understand which channels have been most successful for these topics and what type of content is working well and where. And why is this important? If you've got limited resources, you can choose which channels and which content to prioritize. Um, unfortunately, most of us have limited resources at some point. So um, it's really important just to be able to understand what is and isn't working um, and make sure that you're narrowing down on where you need to be. Um, we're looking at this exact example here. Facebook engagements are through the roof. Twitter shares are okay. Pinterest isn't really working for this particular topic. Um, same with Google+. Plus. This is obviously an older example because there aren't too many people sharing on Google+, Plus these days. Google Trends. Now, just like Google Alerts, this one's really overlooked quite regularly. Um, but Google Trends is a free tool that comes in handy if you've got tons of ideas but very little time. So you can compare topics over different time frames to determine whether something really is worth your time now or maybe at some point in the future. So if you're an online wine retailer, you can help people, you can help look at when people you should be pushing out your wine content. That probably should be a little bit more indexed to when weekends are, but that's okay. Um, it's also a really good way of being able to pick up different language that people are using on the topics. So um, you can get this kind of data from other tools, but those other tools can be very expensive. Tools like SEMrush and, and Moz can give you similar data, um, but using Google Trends, you can pull this out free of charge. And of course, you can actually get ideas from real live humans. And with us all working from, from home fairly regularly, it's pretty easy to forget sometimes that you usually work with other humans. And I know this might sound controversial, but maybe you could talk to them. So all of these tools are great, but nothing really replaces good old fashioned conversations with these real people. You can wear a mask, you can socially distance, it's fine. Talk to people who work in sales roles about the type of questions that they get asked. Talk to your support team about the kind of questions that they get asked. Talk to your customers. You know, you can do surveys, but you can just post on social and ask them questions. Um, and really try to narrow down on what these people need from you. Um, rants from executives is a good one. Um, industry podcasts as well will pick up on various trends that, that are coming through. Um, and this is a really good point here. Frequently asked questions from customers who didn't turn into customers. or So leads that didn't turn into customers, understanding why they didn't become customers, and then that informing what additional content that you could be putting out to address their needs. All right. So now it's time to define our topics. So using all those tools that I've just described, you can solidify what, broad, what are the broad topics that you want to own as a brand. You can map out five to 10 core problems that your buyer persona faces within each broader topic. Uh, and some of those core problems are going to be the same across all of your personas. Some of them are going to differ from persona to persona. And then finally, you can validate your topics by researching your search volume. And if you've got a tool like um, SEMrush or Moz, you can look at the keyword difficulty as well and then really prioritize your um, keywords from that. Okay, so um, to learn how to do in-depth content planning, HubSpot have a course for that. It's free. 
Um, because really what we've just discovered is scratching the surface of how you do it. If you've done this kind of thing before, then it would be reasonably easy for you to pick up those tools and run with it. But if you haven't, I'd recommend looking at this HubSpot Academy course where HubSpot's head of content SEO gives you a step-by-step -step tutorial on how they conduct their own content planning for the HubSpot blog. And you've all probably been on the receiving end of how effective HubSpot's content SEO is. When you go to search for any particular topic in digital marketing and you find that the HubSpot blog is one of the top um, results. So what they're doing is very effective and they've got a lot of data to back that up. All right, so before I go on to the content optimization, I haven't had any questions come through just yet, but has anyone got any questions? I'll give you just a minute or two to get your questions in and then we'll move on to the optimization. All right, no questions so far. So, must be doing an amazing job of explaining this. All right, so let's talk about your content optimization now. Because if we know how to execute a pretty thorough process for coming up with our content ideas, um, we also need to cover off how to optimize your content while you're creating it. We wanna make sure that Google actually sees this content as being relevant to the topics and the keywords that we're trying to target. So let's start with good old organic search. Rather than going through every single content type under the sun, um, I'm gonna focus on written content and how to optimize that for Google, because that's the most relevant with what Ollie's gonna cover in a minute about um, your website content. But I think the other good reason for that is if you get your written content right, it can be a major point of discovery for your prospective customers throughout the entire buyer's journey. Yet, I mean, the mo most marketers I speak to, they still see the concept of SEO as a bit like this. Um, I'm gonna cover off the absolute basics of optimizing for written content. Um, and then I'm going to dig into something that I think most of us on the, on the call are going to, uh, might still be getting to grips with. So let's start with our on-page SEO basics. So when we're putting together our pages, um, and HubSpot have a tool for this, uh, we have a few different areas that we really need to cover off. So first of all, we've got our title tag. So this tells Google and our searches what the page is about. Um, it also appears as the, um, the name of the article in the search results, which is often an overlooked aspect here as well. Then we've got our meta description. So that tells the reader a bit more about the content. And as long as it's relevant to the topic, it should also appear underneath your title tag in your um, in the search results. <coughs> so while we want the title tag and the meta description to be relevant to tell Google about the copy, about the information, we also want it to be appealing because getting the number one or number two result is actually no good if people don't want to click on your article. So we also want to concentrate on selling the content a little bit and bringing people through to your website to increase the click-through rate from search to the website. Then we talk about the page header or the H1 tag, which is where we tell the reader what your content is about. With each image that we put up, we wanna make sure that we have alt text, which describes the image. And it's called alt text because it's the text alternative so if the image can't be displayed for any particular reason, then the description of the image that you put in the alt tag is going to describe the image. So people don't miss out on what that image is. And then finally, our internal links. So we want to help Google find the page and pass link equity or ranking power throughout your website. There's no point in having the information on the website if no one can find it. 
the Moz have a bit of a resource there on their guide to on-page SEO. And that can be quite useful to helping you um, get on top of these basics. So when we talk about those internal links, what we want to look at is structuring your content using the pillar and clusters model, whereby we have topic clusters, we have a pillar content in the middle, and then we have all of our cluster content around the outside. Then we have hyperlinks between the pillar content and the cluster content. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to make the articles, all this cluster content is designed to address all of those different need cases that we saw around the outside of Answer the Public. Um, and then we have internal links back to the pillar page. And when we've got the pillar page there, what we're trying to do is describe the, um, demonstrate our authority on the topic using the pillar page. And the cluster content helps provide that uh, link power back to the pillar content to really just tell Google, okay, well, I don't, I don't just understand the, the topic, but I understand the topic well enough that we've got all of this supporting content that demonstrates my knowledge in that topic. So now we're going to use a HubSpot example. So in this case, we've got the blog.hubspot.com example. And again, they have so much data to back this up that it's really useful and they're so generous to share it. They're quite happy to discuss what they do from an SEO perspective. But when it comes to things like marketing, agency, sales, as topics under blog.hubspot.com, you've got all these different pieces of content. And this is how they used to structure their um, blog. <coughs> and this worked quite well for them. But by um, adopting the pillar structure, you can see now it's much more organized around each of the topics that they're trying to cover through the primary domain. Uh, and they've seen some pretty significant increases in traffic by doing this but also attracting the right kind of people. And Ollie's going to go into this in a little bit more detail, so I don't want to steal too much of his thunder, but it makes a lot more sense from a logic perspective and also from a, um, uh, from a results perspective. So how do we actually create the topic clusters? Well, first of all, you listen to Ollie in about three minutes. Um, but you've also, there's some content marketing training on the HubSpot Academy that you can watch as well, um, where you can learn how to create your topic clusters and your pillar pages. The other area that we want to just chat about quickly is our featured snippets, or otherwise known as position zero. So this is where you get the answer without actually having to go through to the page. So this is extracted from one of the top ranking pages for that query. So usually if you're the first result um, and there's an opportunity to appear in the uh, feature snippet, Google can pull those out. Now the new data coming through is saying that 12.3% of search queries have now featured snippets in their results. So we're seeing an increase in the number of search queries where People don't go to the website at all to see the information that they're looking for. So the vast majority of featured snippets are triggered by long tail keywords. So those are the ones that we were talking about with answer the public around the outside of your central pillar page. So how do we look at ranking in a snippet? Go back to your keyword research spreadsheet and find the search queries that have feature snippets. So SEMrush will tell you this and tell you if there's an opportunity to get a feature snippet. Analyze the content that's being pulled into the featured snippet. So how is the, the current featured snippet being structured? Is it numbered, bulleted, listed? Is it within a H2 tag? Are they using some kind of structured data? What can we borrow from the current leader to try and get that position off them? And then you can use those findings to make updates to your content to increase your rankings there and get that featured snippet position. 
So this is a great idea to do, particularly for pages that you already have that rank on them on page one of Google. All right. So last, optimizing for conversions. So ask yourself, what's the most valuable next step for the prospective customer? Not for you, for the prospective customer. Considering the purpose of most content is to encourage a next step, you need to ask yourself what the next step should be for the person consuming it. And when we do um, HubSpot audits, this is probably one of the areas that we generally find people haven't really considered. We're gonna put some content out, we wanna get the number one ranking, we get good website traffic, but we don't actually get a conversion off the back end of it. So if we go back to our goals, it really depends on where in the buyer's journey the content fits. So if we go back to our um, awareness stage, consideration stage, in the awareness stage, as a goal for an action, you might want people to subscribe to your newsletter, download your ebook, or maybe join a Facebook group. Right. When we get to the consideration stage though, maybe it's attend an event or a webinar, speak to sales, something else that helps them understand that you're a good solution for what they're trying to target. And then finally, we have the decision stage. So in this case, it might be starting a free trial so they can see how good the software is, arranging a reference call, um, or buying ultimately. So, this is a post on the HubSpot blog about optimizing your content for featured snippets. So at the awareness stage, this person doesn't necessarily know what the HubSpot software is yet. They just need help with SEO and they know that the HubSpot um, blog was the top listing. So you can see that the next step that HubSpot wants somebody to take here is to download the complete SEO starter pack which also feels like the most valuable next step for the person reading this. I already know that they're interested in SEO because they're reading this article. So we want them to fill out the lead form and in return for providing, for HubSpot providing the value of the, the ebook, um, HubSpot receive the information from the form that's going to help them discover what the next most valuable step is for the, the person visiting the site. So, and of course, if you use the CTA functionality in HubSpot, we can then track how many people have clicked on these and personalize their next step as well. So then we move on to the consideration stage. So if someone is in the consideration stage, they know they need to improve their marketing or sales or customer service, and they think HubSpot software might be able to help. So in this case, it might be most helpful for them to speak to somebody about their company situation. So the most appropriate value adding conversion point here is probably booking some time with somebody at HubSpot to chat to them about what their problem is. Uh, and that's where the marketing widget, the meeting widgets are perfect. You can embed these in your blogs, embed these in your website pages and people can book 30 minute meeting into your sales reps calendars or your calendar or, or whatever might make sense for your business. And then finally, the decision stage. So if they're in the decision stage, they're actively evaluating solutions to their problems. So that would be your software. And at this time, the conversion point is obviously the sale, but there's also content that you can um, share with them that will help convert them into a sale. So that might be customer case studies, uh, testimonials. Um, it could be a discount code if you're in e-commerce and you're trying to, to sell them on purchasing some, some clothing um, or selling a product that requires less consideration where you can do a, a code. All right. So key takeaways for this is map your content onto the buyer's journey, really make it relevant to your personas, uh, and then optimize and structure your content for search. So 
Before I hand over to Ollie to take you through the practical side, do we have any last questions that anyone wants to ask? No. No worries. Ollie, are you ready to go? If you think of any questions after the um, webinar today, just um, send us an email, or jump on our website, and uh, we'd be happy to take you through any questions you might have. And so I'd like to introduce our account strategist, Refuel Creative, Holly. Who I think he's just getting his audio ready to go. All right, we'll just have a couple of minutes break and we'll be back with you shortly. Ollie. You can hear me okay, Ryan? Yep. Perfect. Cool. Sorry about that, people. Uh, I'll just share my screen so 
Um, as Ryan said, I'm going to, we're now going to have a look at creating topic clusters in HubSpot. So to start, you need a broad topic, which as its name suggests, is something broad enough to, to explore on a deeper level. Now, either you're starting from scratch with your content or you have plenty of content already. So if you have little to no content, just think of topics that you want your business to have authority over. Is it digital marketing? Is it men's clothing? Is it house building tips? Uh, and if you have created a lot of content over the years, uh, if you've run a blog or things like that, uh, run a content audit and group all of your existing pages um, by topic fo focus. So HubSpot can help you do that. So we're gonna jump into it. All right. So if you go to, once you've decided on a topic, go to your HubSpot portal, um, you go to marketing, website, and SEO. And then you click on the topics tab. So if it's your first time here, you'll have just a button with um, research topics uh, where you can basically enter any topic that um, you have thought of. And if you, if you have been in HubSpot in a, in a topics section before, it will look something like that. Uh, so you've got all of your main topics listed here. You can see that uh, in the Refuel Creative Portal, we've got a few. So we're just going to go into them. So once you've got your topics, you can click on each of them, and there are uh, a few things that you can do here. So you see that your main topic is in the middle here, uh, and all around that we've got a few subtopics. Uh, so you can add them through this button. So you can decide um, on a keyword to, um, that you want to add as a subtopic, um, or you can, um, HubSpot is actually going to give you recommendations. So if we click on that, you can find a related content. So for example, we found that uh, we've got a page about um, how we provide SEO services. So I could click on that and add to topic. And you can see that um, it added that content as, um, as a subtopic. I can name a subtopic. So for example, SEO services, um, like that. And so it's added it to the topic cluster. So um, you can also, um, like, so if you had, so if you had added a subtopic, um, so for example, what is SEO through here? Um, you can research keywords. It shows you the monthly searches, the rough monthly searches that happen. So for example, yeah, what is SEO? I'll save that subtopic and you can attach content to it. So it'll, HubSpot will give, you, um, will give you suggestions so for content, or you can um, create new content, so a blog post, a landing page, or a site page. Um, you can search for content, uh, or you can add external URLs. So for example, if you have a YouTube video, for example, somewhere that you want to put into your topic cluster, um, you can attach it there. So the, the goal, so you can add YouTube, a YouTube video, for example, because the goal here is to provide lasting awareness uh, and to increase the authority of your content pillar. So the most important thing, remember, is um, to provide long-term value to your visitors. So it doesn't really matter if it's on your website or not. Um, the objective is to really give uh, your visitors what they are looking for and to provide them with value. 
So you can also add content um, through the content itself. So for example, if I wanted to, um, to add a blog post, uh, so we've got quite an old blog post that is called Quick Wins to Improve Your SEO. Um, so if you go to edit the content, it wants to load. So you go to optimize. You can see here that you can select the topic that um, this blog post is about. So if I go to topic and I enter the name of my broad topic, search engine optimization. So if this blog post was your pillar page, you can just attach it to the topic here. Um, if it is related to a subtopic, so in this case it is, um, my subtopic can be improving SEO, and you select the supporting content, and you can add which subtopic it is about. So for example here, improve SEO, and you just attach it to the topic. And if we go back to our topic cluster, normally it should now appear linked to that topic cluster. You can see that now the blog post is listed under the subtopic of improving the SEO. So once you've got all of your topics and subtopics and contents organized like this, um, it's time to add your pillar page. So it can either be a page on your website or a blog, depending on uh, how your website is structured and what you want to achieve. So So your pillar page is going to be um, just like any, so to design it, uh, it will need to be like any page on your website, um, but there's a few things that um, you want to keep in mind. So firstly, um, keeping the, the user experience in mind. Your page must be educational, it must be inspiring, and especially it must be user friendly. Uh, it must answer the user's main questions. So for example, um, about search engine optimization, um, you will have a pillar page that answers what is um, search optimization and what it does and things like that. So it needs to answer the, the questionnaire that they wanted answered when they clicked on your content uh, and it should allow them to deep dive into relevant content if they wish to through links. So it's good practice to tell the readers uh, early on what they will learn on a page. So obviously if it's about search engine optimization, you could have a, certain, um, a small paragraph or a table of contents that um, tells them that you are going to learn about what is search engine optimization, what it does, how to optimize it, things like that. So remember that you're not building links um, just for the sake of it. Links must help you to guide your audience to relevant content and to direct them to solutions. So you don't want to basically just throw any link that you can on your pillar page without any context. It really needs to, to provide a solution for your readers. Um, as I said, including a table of content, an anchor link table of content is good practice because uh, that makes it easy for your readers to navigate the page. So in my example, what is search engine optimization would be linked in a table of contents. And if you click on it, it will take you directly to the section that explains what uh, search engine optimization is. Uh, it's also a good practice to, to include a short video at the start offering a, a brief synopsis of what um, your visitors will be learning. 
and that creates a more engaging experience for them um, and it can help reduce bounce rate which is important for your pillar page to rank well remember that you want your pillar page you want visitors to stay on your pillar page for as long as possible and to stay on your website for as long as possible so a video is a is a good solution for that uh, it's also a good idea to to add a content offer so to firstly repackage the on-page content into a downloadable pdf um, to allow visitors to take the content with them uh, hubspot actually did a research a few years ago uh, where they found out that about 90 percent of people prefer to have the type of content that is on a pillar page in a pdf um, rather than read it on a website um, it makes sense because when you find something um, that is of value to you, uh, it makes sense for you. It's natural to, to want to take it with you. So you can add that. It's also good practice to, to add even more content um, by providing, for example, a practical exercise for, for your visitors um, that will help them practice what they're learning uh, through your content. Um, the title tag is important and all the SEO basics that Ryan went through earlier on, but especially the title tag, try your best to create a human friendly tag that explains what the page is about and covers the, the broad topic, um, the contextual topic and additional context. So for example, um, it could be about um, if it's about bio personas, um, the, you could have the title tags of five best tips to build your bio personas. Um, a title tag like that that takes as bio persona is your broad topic. It will be in a title tag and it tells people and um, search engines what your pillar page is about. Um, consider using templates. That's an important one. Um, if you create your first pillar page, make it a template. Um, and reuse it. It gives a consistent learning experience for your audience between all your different content, uh, and it makes all, also makes it easier for you to create quality content quicker. Uh, and finally, constantly review, update, improve, and optimize your content and your content pillars. Um, and this is where the content performance tab in HubSpot comes in. So I'll go back to HubSpot. So you can see that we're back into our topic section and you've got a content performance tab here. So here you can see the performance of your pillar page. You can actually add your pillar page through this if you don't have a pillar page on there. And you can also see the performance of all of your subtopics. Um, so you can also see if your so you can see what content is linked to what subtopic keywords, uh, and you can see if that subtopic is linked back to your pillar page. So that's especially important. Uh, we'll go back to it in just a second, but you can actually also see that through here. So you can see that I've got um, green lines here, which means that all of those um, subtopic contents actually have a link on them that links back to your pillar page and that give your pillar page authority. Uh, you can see, for example, that the one that I just added uh, about the SEO service has a red line here. Um, that means that we don't have a link um, going back to the pillar page, so we'll want to add it there because it's good practice to um, always link both ways. Um, so obviously your content pillar will take people um, to the subtopics if they want to learn more, but it's also good to have every subtopic link back to your pillar page. So you can see here, we can check the link over here and it'll find um, after a bit you'll find if you've added a link on the page um, it'll find out that it's linked and it'll turn 
that to green it, you can also do it through here. You see that you've got your attached content here and you can check the link. Um, to add links to your sub content, uh, HubSpot can help you do that. So through the pillar link module. Um, so if you go to, to find it, it's, <coughs> sorry, it's nice and free. Uh, it's easy to find. So if you go to your app, into your marketplace, you go to your asset marketplace. Um, you will go to module. And then you can find the pillar page link module. It's slow to load. Cool. So if sorry, just hop stop taking its time. Just going to let it run for a second because it seems every time I refresh it, it's not liking it. There we go. So you can search for your pillar page link. Um, so you can see that on review it's already installed, but you can install that module. What it does is that it creates a, a simple module that looks like this. Um, that I've got the text topic, and then you can um, link to your pillar page. And it's fully customizable, so you can change the, the preceding text and can also change um, the name um, that appears to link to your page. So it's obviously not the only way to link back to your pillar page. You can just do it manually, uh, but it's a quick and easy way to do it. Um, if you want to go next level, um, as, as you build pillar pages over time, um, you can create broad topic clusters, which are sort of your next level um, topic clusters on your website. So they sort of look like this. Um, so that's, by the way, a diagram from uh, Justin Champion at HubSpot, who's uh, sort of the king of link building over there. Uh, and you would be very familiar with if uh, you spend a bit of time on the HubSpot Academy. Um, <clears throat> so you can see in the middle here um, that you've got your broad topic um, uh, with your pillar page. So your pillar page here would take the, the shape of a resource content pillar. So basically a curated um, collection of links with a brief description um, of each contextual topics or subtopics. Then you go your subtopics here um, with uh, each as well um, with a pillar page. So those, well, those ones would be 10x content pillars. So more in-depth guides with links to um, subtopics. So each of those 10x content pillars would connect to um, a lot of different subtopics. So this structure is great because it means that each subtopic, um, each asset, like in, uh, in this cluster, um, gives increased the authority of broader topics, which again, increase the authority of your very broad topic. So it really, all of your topics connect to each other uh, and all the pages benefit from the, grow the growth of awareness and the increasing authority of each component. So don't worry too much about this if you're only just starting with um, topic clusters. It's better to build clusters slowly and, and well rather than rushing um, to get as much content connected as quickly as possible. Um, but then good thing to remember and to keep in mind um, over the long term. So in terms of last um, of 
last advice, um, as you build your topic clusters, just remember that um, search engines are constantly evolving to get better at finding valuable content. And in this case, it's quality information that's structured uh, in a way that both humans and crawlers can, can understand. So crawlers are made and improved constantly to operate like searching humans. So instead of trying to find a way to trick a new algorithm update, take an organized approach and think about how a human would like to navigate your site and how you can help, help them find what they're looking for organically and in a, in a smooth manner. That's really the biggest piece of advice about topic clusters is that you have to create um, value for your users really before you start using it and you have to present that value in a way that's attractive to, to human readers. So that's it from me. So if you've got any questions about how to set up topic clusters in HubSpot or about um, topic clusters in general, uh, Ryan and I will be more than happy to answer them. So I'll give you a couple of minutes. Welcome back, Ryan. Thank you, Ollie. So I got a question here from a very valuable um, attendee today. Ollie, do you need yeah. to connect Google Search Console to the Topic Cluster tool to make it work? Um, you don't need to, but uh, it's good practice because if we're going back to HubSpot, um, so HubSpot has an integration. Uh, so if you go to the app marketplace, this is going to take a while again. Um, but if you go to the app mar marketplace, there's a Google uh, search console. Yep. Yeah. So there's a Google search console integration uh, that's um, fully varied, fully certified by HubSpot and all that jazz. So you can see that we've, um, we've already got it in Refuel and it's good practice because if we go back to our topic cluster, I'd probably argue while you're doing that, Ollie, that the Google Search Console integration is one of the most underused ones. It's free and everyone can, can add it into their portal pretty quickly and easily, um, but we still find we're going into portals and people aren't running it. Yep. Um, so yeah, so if we go back to that topic cluster, you can see that if I, if I click on a subtopic, well, um, the Google Search Console integration here is to give me like the top search queries um, that could be related to that subtopic. So as Ryan said, um, it's super simple to, to install. It's free, so there's really no good reason not to set it up. Um, and it can really be helpful to determine if you're, if you're ranking for the right keywords and it can help you find um, find topics or find keywords um, or tell you that if you're not ranking for the right keywords that you may need to do a bit uh, some um, more on-page SEO with your content. All right, do we have any other questions? All right, if you have any more questions after today, Ollie just put our details up on this fancy slide here. Um, but you can give us a call or um, flick us through an email or jump on social. We'd be happy to answer them on social. Um, but otherwise, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we've got another one in a couple of months, so make sure you jump on and hopefully there'll be less technical issues for the next time. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you, everyone.